Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker for this conference, which is Fred Anglin. Um, we actually got introduced last night. I wanted to uh, let everyone know that he is actually the recipient of the Silver M that he was awarded to, uh, last evening, which is really a lifetime um, honor in journalism award. So we have been very honored to have him here for quite a few things in the last uh, 24 hours. Um, Fred Anklin is an Ole Miss graduate and a graduate of the journalism program here. He is a very seasoned journalist with a proven track record. He has nearly four decades in the newspaper industry. Um, he has written, reported, edited, and managed one of the nation's top newspapers. For 27 years, he's been with USA Today. He uh, shared with us his illustrious career, starting with the Claren Ledger, where he won a Pulitzer Prize, along with the team for some of the work that he did there. And he uh, noted last evening, and I hope he's going to share a little bit more about it now, how technology has really impacted the news industry, especially with USA Today. So with great pleasure, I introduce to you Fred Anglin. Let me make sure I'm all squared away before I get started. I'm not, uh, I'm a print guy, so all this technology as you can imagine, uh, from my gray hair and, as Chris mentioned, my seasoned experience, um, it has been quite an adventure um, watching what's happened in our industry just in my career since I left here in 1977. Um, incredible changes. Um, and one thing that uh, kept going through my head as I was asked to start talking about the perspective from print, from the newsroom, about all this stuff that's been happening and how are we coping with it? And what path do we see uh, to keep us going? Um, it reminded me, um, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Young Frankenstein. Are you familiar with that? Okay. And, you know, Gene Wilder, wants to, you know, kind of not be what his ancestors were and not do that kind of experimentation. Until one night he's in bed and he has a kind of a dream. And he ends up thrashing around destiny, destiny, no escaping destiny. Well, when you talk about print and the news business, <clears throat> substitute the word technology for destiny. Technology, technology, no escaping technology, okay? That's kind of how we've reacted all the way through on this. And frankly, continue today in many ways. Um, I'd like to say particularly those who are the dinosaurs and want to wallow in the mud pits and be discovered centuries from now they will continue to resist this technology and resist what's going on out there. Let me tell you about uh, the latest technology when I graduated from Ole Miss, 1977. It was the IBM Selectric typewriter. This thing was awesome. Now, who's ever used a typewriter? Lewis has, okay, there's a few. All right? And before the IBM Selectric came around, you'd get banging away. And some of us, you know, reporters, you'd get banging away. And you're interviewing someone on the phone and taking notes, and the keys would jam on you. And then you've got your hands trying to get the keys out, and you're not typing, and the guy's still talking. You know, real problem. So the IBM Selectric, little ball, it rotated rapidly. Boom, boom, boom. You could type as fast as you wanted to. Never jammed on you. So that was, uh, that was the big technological advance. And um, if I'd only known about all these other things, um, what would I have done differently at Ole Miss, do you think? Anything? What if, they, what if I'd known there were going to be iPhones, a web? I wouldn't have done one thing differently at Ole Miss. 
I would have learned my craft. I would have learned the fundamentals of news reporting. I would have learned about fairness and balance. I would have focused on ethics. I would have understood how to run the IBM Selectric because that was the latest technology. But you have to be prepared, particularly in this world we live in, for change. What's the news business all about? Reporting about change. You know, most times, what's news? Something just changed. The earth moved during, an, during a World Series in San Francisco. Okay, that was a long time ago, but that's change. Planes hit a tower in New York. I'm driving to work in Washington and a plane flies over my car and I know it's going straight for the Pentagon, which it did. Change. That's what we were preparing for. That's what this is all about. And um, the way we get that news out is always going to change. I think, how many of you had the chance to hear Hank talk earlier? Anybody? A few of you, great. How about Lewis earlier this morning? Some others, okay. There's um, um, really been some great perspective from their side of how they are trying to figure out ways to make TV news, in Hank's case, work really well. Or a publication like Forbes, and what's the model, and how are we getting out of here? I'm not involved in those kinds of discussions, all right? I'm not in that part of the business from the news side. What I am is in the newsroom, watching news happen, figuring out how do we get it out there. Um, in my early years, we finally started having computers show up in the newsroom. Hard for you to believe, but there was a time when there weren't computers. Um, the earliest ones, you, the only ones who had the, ter the uh, computer terminals were the editors. The reporters uh, would still type our stuff up and scan it into a system that the editors could edit on. The, uh, eventually, we got terminals for reporters, but we shared them. And that was a lot of fun because uh, you had to get back to the newsroom after whatever thing you were covering and try to grab the terminal. Because if you didn't and your, your desk mate had it, you had to wait for them to finish your, their story and turn it in before you could start writing your story. So um, I had one colleague who was a horrible speller. And I realized she would, there'd be this pause and she would reach for the dictionary and I would just say, hey, what's the word? Because I'm a pretty good speller. And that's how I sped her copy to the desk so I could write. Um, but this is, again, we're starting to deal with, you know, this is an impact on my day, is this computer that's supposed to make things faster. It's actually slowing me down a little bit. So with, I think Hank mentioned this before, that the, the changes that come in the improvements that are brought in, the new computer system. People always are kind of, I don't want to do that. I, I, you're resistant. Why do I have to get my stories this way now? Why do I have to get them that way now? Um, all this sort of thing is what happens. It's a culture, if you want to call it that. It's human behavior. Um, you know, if you're used to driving your car a certain way, and all of a sudden, you know, the turn signal wasn't right there where you could flip it with your finger, what would you do? You know, you'd complain. Even though it might be a much smarter way or place to put something like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting to see all this resistance to change. Um, I managed to live through in Jackson one of the big technological changes for our industry as far as print is concerned. In uh, 1982, the Jackson Papers were family owned. And um, we heard rumors that we were going to be purchased by somebody, another organization like maybe the New York Times. 
Uh, it turned out on April Fool's Day, a guy named Al Newharth walked into our newsroom and said that he had just bought the state of Mississippi because he had purchased the Clarion Ledger and the Hattiesburg American. And it wasn't, at the time, I'm going to tell you, we had one of the best small newspapers in the country down there. There was a fantastic staff. We were doing great investigative reporting. And um, he didn't buy us because of that. He had this idea that he would launch a national newspaper, printed all over the country at the same time. And he would use satellite technology. He would have, an, a instead of a press room, he would have a satellite upload room, the pages, would be scanned, sent up by satellite, sent down all over the country, and printed. So what he needed was presses. He needed presses in specific spots all over the country so that he could print it and distribute it. And everybody got the same paper on the same day, same stories, same fantastic color registration, something that had baffled a lot of companies. Many papers didn't run color except on Sunday because you needed two days to get everything all matched up and all the plates and all this sort of thing. So he bought us not for our journalism. He bought us for our press and because he was launching a new idea. And that changed a lot of things. Um, look at something as simple as the weather page. USA Today had the first color weather page. And people just marveled at this page of information about the weather. Um, it was, uh, nowadays, everybody's got a weather page. Everybody's got the same color bars. Your phone has it, right? So um, what's new or different about it? Nothing. About two months ago, we took our weather page off the back page. It's too precious of a spot for us to either display a really special story, like we did yesterday. We had a story about new NSA-type surveillance of people's telephone calls, and we jumped the story to the entire back page and displayed it very nicely. Or for advertising. That's a prime spot. So um, the... Um, The other thing that happened, um, I'm going to lose my track here, but here. Um, as I moved through uh, Gannett, I, once they bought the paper, I moved to Washington and uh, began reporting there. And we got started having our own portable computers to carry with us. And I was, again, this is a lot of nostalgia, but this is uh, Curtis Wilkie and I were t remembering yesterday about how you <coughs> go cover, say, a presidential stop, and you'd go listen to the speech, and then you'd go to a filing center, and then you'd get out your computer and you'd write up a story, and you could see about eight lines of copy on this thing. So if you wanted to change things, you had to remember where you were in the story and define it and move it and this sort of thing. And uh, then you'd get a phone hook up and transmit it, and that was really being on top of the news. So you compare that with today, where you can, as soon as the president says something, you can tweet it. And that's the kind of change I've seen just in my career. And I'll tell you that the acceleration of change is astronomical. It is so fast that we almost can't keep up with it. Our, um, our social media people, we have a whole team, social media. That's all they do is try to place our stuff out there. They uh, manage things like our Facebook page. And it's, um, it's amazing that every, it seems like, month, something new comes up that they're starting to use. Um, it's... Uh, new ways to upload video, new ways to upload your photographs. So 
the one thing you have to do is be prepared for that change and just know it's not ever going to stop. Never. Um, we've done a lot of things to try to keep print going. One of the things we have, um, because Gannett owns so many newspapers around the country, one thing we've come up with, and we've actually more than doubled our circulation print-wise, is that we now take a slimmed down version of USA Today, and that's inserted into local Gannett newspapers, okay? So they get delivered and can print and put right into their paper national and international news from USA Today. It's a brand. They actually raise their subscription price and people keep their subscriptions because they're getting something they know is important. It's, this is a national brand that suddenly is showing up inside my newspaper every day. So that's a neat thing. It does a couple of things for the company too in that you don't need maybe as many people at the newspaper worrying about watching the wires or things like that. So we don't have as many wire editors, don't have as many copy editors. We can have a few more reporters focusing on local stories, statewide stories, things that are important just to that readership right there. Um, so that's great, and it's a little budget, budgetary savings. It's been very popular with the, with the folks that get this. And what um, is really exciting is now other companies have been approaching us, and they want this in their newspapers. They're not Gannett properties, okay? They're a couple of small chains in the Midwest, and they will take the product, the same thing we're, pre we're already preparing this for our newspapers. We have four different sizes of it, so it can fit the various print formats. We're taking this and putting it into our Gannett papers. We've got the staff to do that. Now they're coming up and saying, we'll pay you a flat fee if you'll let us have that too. And we just figure out a way to drop them the PDFs in a secure spot where they can get them and they send us a check. We don't have to hire any more staff. We don't have to buy any of that newsprint that's being used. We don't not have to buy the print, the ink. We don't need to run the press, which is very expensive. So we're just getting money for something we're already doing. And excitingly, the Chicago Sun-Times just picked this up, okay? That's a market, Gannett's USA Today traditionally has had difficulty getting into the market and now, at least in that paper, now it's struggling, but they saw this again as an opportunity to do the same thing. They can refocus their staff on local news. They can do some you know, other things locally that they want. They don't have to, they almost don't have to worry about national and international news. So one of my jobs at night, I'm the night senior editor for USA Today. And what I'm doing is I'm managing the production of USA Today, as you know it, and buy it on the street. Four other versions of that that can range from six to ten pages or in a tabloid format, a dozen pages. And we push those out. So I have, instead of having three deadlines a night, I've got three deadlines for the main paper. I've got four deadlines for this insert and it comes in four different sizes. So I have to keep track to make sure all the updates are getting in all these files and everything. It's very complicated. But it's a lot of fun and it's, it's gotten people energized because we've thought outside the box a little bit and figured out a new way to keep print going and to keep print um, viable at least a little while longer. Um, so, uh, so who cares about that, right? Because print is dead, right? We are the largest circulation newspaper in the country. And um, only 20% of our readership is in print. Okay? 
We have done all these creative things. We've doubled our circulation size. And we don't think about the print product. Okay? I'm putting it out every night. But the focus of the entire newsroom, the entire company during the day, is not about print. We've made all this money over the years. It is about news, information, our brand, making people connect our brand. This is news that you need to have. And we're going about that in a variety of ways. When we first started our websites back in the 90s, it was, oh, okay, this is some special stuff. People might need some special skills. Uh, we'll get some people who know something about a computer, and we'll put them on the other floor far away. And then once we've written our stories, we'll send them to them, and they can put them on the Internet. Um, as both of our other speakers have said, you know, that's a model that it just isn't going to work. You can't wait. You've certainly got to be competitive. We have, um, in most of my experience, it was always reporters spend most of the day writing a story, making calls, getting it just right. His editor took care of it, uh, edited it, sent it on to the copy desk. They would look at it. Other editors would look at it, like I, at night, right before it went into press, into the, into the paper. Just don't, can't do that. First of all, we can't afford, with revenue declining, to have that many editors. Secondly, and this is something you need to think about as you're going into this field, is that you've got to be your own editor. You have got to be able to make it sharp and to the point and something distinctive that hooks the reader. And you've got to do it right now, OK? So you can't be waiting for the news to happen. You've got to be ready to write that story before it happens. You've got to sharpen your skills. You've got to know, OK, if a, if a verdict's coming down in the Sarnev trial, that's you know, pretty predictable. So you've got to have everything lined up ahead of time, which we do when that happens. You know, we've got video. We've got a reporter ready to do a stand-up that we can load online instantly. Um, live. Uh, we have stories already written with B matter that can go up. B matter is stuff that it gives you all the background, and all you have to do is say guilty or not guilty, boom, out the door, and it's posted. And then it's actually tweeted first. We send our alerts out. So it's kind of a routine is now <clears throat> tweet, post, write. So get it out there. Be competitive. We watch how closely. Were we a minute ahead of CNN? Were we 30 seconds behind the Wall Street Journal? Whatever. We want people to think of us as the place to go when news is developing. We're USA Today. We're national. And we're covering all of it. There are specialized publications that are going to beat us on some specialized stuff. But when it's time for breaking news like that, we want you to think of us. Now, we um, do a lot of, um, we tweet it out. You write, our editor, Dave Calloway, is just amazing about this. I'll be sitting there and saying, tweet this out. And he's sitting on his phone at dinner, and he'll send a, a message to me, get this thing out. And then where's the, where's the link? Where's the first couple of graphs? And then within four or five minutes, where's the story? We've got to have it up, and we've got to keep it. You don't want to just have people go to, there's nothing there. So it's got to all be in sequence and get up quickly. Um, it's exciting. It's fun. It's, it's dramatic. It's different from anything I was ever doing before. And I've just had to learn about a lot of this stuff. And a lot of it I don't know about. I supervise people who know how to do this. And that's what uh, has been great, is to learn the different ways that we can get this, this kind of news, news out. What we um, 
are trying to do is, is make our content so important that that's what you want. When you hear there's news, you want to go there. That's a difficult thing to achieve. Um, right now, we are one of the publications out there that does not have a paywall. So you can read all of our content all the time. The publisher says the reason is right now, so far, we have not gotten to the point that our content is special enough on a regular basis to put a paywall up. Now, we've been working on developing enterprise and enterprising angles and developing audiences, but what point, at some point we will probably have to go to a paywall. At the moment, we don't. But we do want to emphasize our content and um, get, uh, get you thinking about us as soon as news happens. It's not easy to get a staff, as was mentioned earlier today, to change this process of come in, write my story, make some calls. Um, Dave Calloway's been the editor for a little over two years. <clears throat> he, I talked to him about this, and he said just the other day, he said, I've worked hard to stop people here from thinking about how is this going to play in the newspaper? Or how is this going to play on the web? We have to think about how are we making our content unique and then worry about pushing it out to a platform. So what we're trying to get our newsroom to get to is focus on the content. Don't worry about it. And, and as a reporter, you like to know my story is going to play on page one or my story is going to get the big package inside on page three or something like that or my story is going to lead the website. And what he's trying to get the staff to the point of is make your content as good as possible, as important as possible. And we'll worry about how to get it out there or how to present it. Don't think about that. Don't worry about that. Worry about being on the content and pushing it out. Um, so that's our, that's our big challenge is rethinking that. Um, We also, um, another thing is just the, the whole use of how people are using their devices when they watch, uh, when they're on the web, using a PC, rarely, when they're at home, rarely, right? In the office, I think everybody in America checks out news on, their, on the web while they're working, right? That's what we see. The traffic's tremendous middle of the day. Not at all in the morning, not at all at night. Phones almost all the time. Tablets almost specifically at night. Um, so it's interesting to see these different. So if you start trying to match your, when are you going to, how are you going to deliver your content? When are you going to deliver your content? You're missing an audience, probably. So don't think about how you're going to get it to them. Just get it and get it up there, because we have so many ways to get it out. You know, we'll, we'll, if you've got the phone, we'll send it through the link that way. If you are on your tablet, you can use our app there. If you're on the web, fine. If you want to walk by the newsstand and pick up the newspaper, you can get it that way, too. Don't worry about that. So that's been a, a very difficult thing, and I can tell you it hasn't changed yet. Some people have gotten on top of that very quickly. Others have not. And uh, it's just a, a very um, slow process, changing things. We have um, had to redeploy people. You know, some people who were editing now go back to reporting. Uh, fewer editors. One thing that took. Uh, a really big change was we had to have copy desks. The top copy desk traditionally would come in in the evening and wait for all the copy to come in and edit it and write headlines. Well, we've got copy editors now 24-7. We've got people who are copy editors who aren't used to working that schedule, but they're coming in at 6 in the morning. We've got a couple of people in Europe, which is how we handle the overnight. We've got people working in Europe 
So their day, at two in the morning when I go home, they're picking up everything, because it's, you know, eight in the morning in London. It's morning, beginning of the day for them. So that's one way that we approach this. Sometimes we, though, ask people to work overnight. You know, work all weekend. Work from 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's the kind of world we're in. That's the, that's the kind of business we're in. We've got to have that content. We've got to be competitive. And we need to be out there. Um, what we... Um, Okay, yeah, even, even uh, Callaway says even the apps. You know, we're not even thinking about the apps. They're there, but don't think about how you're going to deliver this stuff. You want to be available to your audience wherever they are, whenever they're there. Now, it can get a little crazy because you start thinking, oh, gosh, we've got a deadline every minute. So we've got to rush it out there. And that's another thing you've got to guard against. We have copy editors there, so someone's ready to post a story. Someone's still got to look at it and copy edit it and approve it to be printed. Put printed, I say, put out there. Um, you, in this day and age, there's so much competitiveness. We often will go with a link that says media reports are saying, which is something we never would have done in print. <coughs> in the older days. When we do that, we are acknowledging that we don't have it. Somebody else is reporting it. It's out there. People are talking about it. And we're trying to nail it. And we work as quickly as possible with the staff to try to match that story or measure up that story and see if it's really true, if it's warning the, the, the type of attention it's getting. We are monitoring you know, Twitter and that sort of thing all the time, other websites. Um, just waiting, seeing what they're doing, being aware of what we've got, um, when we can score with a, a story that, like we had yesterday about the surveillance. That's a big win for us, we think. It's kind of helping to build that brand. And uh, it's uh, what we're all about. There was a little talk earlier today about storytelling. You know, the old traditional pyramid story. Um, what's going on with that? Well, you've already heard me say what we do often is tweet. What are we tweeting? Just a, a lead, a sentence, a piece of information. And then we're adding information. And most rapidly, what we're adding often is not more words. What we're adding are images when we can, video. Video is just crazy. You just can't get enough video. Um, so we are, we've got a whole staff, again, working 24-7 now. Something starts happening, we've got video. If um, you know, somebody like B.B. King is ill, we've got an obit ready. We've got video ready just in case something happens. We can post it immediately. Um, not that we hope something like that happens, but we have to be ready for that sort of thing. Um, of course, they love the video because you can always run a little 10 or 15 second ad right on the front of the video as you start out. So that's one of the models we're using is every story now, practically, we're striving to get every story having video with it. That's a big, big challenge. You, know, you think we're print. You know, but yet we're looking for video. Where's it coming from? Again, adaptability by the staff. They're shooting video with their smartphones and loading it up. So it's, it's, uh, it's a real change for the staff as well. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you get readers' eyes on it? You know, we've got one story going, but We'll often have three or four different angles. You know, this thing here, you can look at it from another angle. Um, that's, that's a good way we can post it multiple times, and a reader might like this approach or that approach. Either way, they're reading our content. It doesn't really matter to us. 
uh, we can post it as part of, say, uh, the German air crash situation. Okay, you can post it as news. You can post it with our travel stuff. You can post it under air safety. You can tweet it out different ways. Um, so it's just this, again, don't worry about how we're delivering it. Get the story and get it out there. Whenever we can be, um, have something that we think is exclusive or enterprising, it's a real win. We, I talked to some classes yesterday, and one of the things we did recently off that German air crash, and this was about a week later, but it got tremendous traffic on a number of our platforms. Our, uh, one of our investigative guys looked at FAA records over 20 years in the U.S., and he found that in that time period, 41 private pilots had used an airplane to kill themselves, sometimes with people on board with them. So the idea that someone would take a jetliner and fly it into a mountain and kill 150 people, that's you know obscene to think about. And yet, in our country, it was in smaller things. People do this almost on a regular basis. And that's a startling thing to think about. So that's the way, you know, with a, with a uh, bit of enterprise like that, like I said, it gets <coughs> tremendous traffic. And then what we try to do is um, we're thinking about um, how do we get that story out there. One of the things I did want to mention was uh, with our social media team, it's just the whole Facebook or whatever's out there sharing it, okay? As uh, Hank was talking about earlier, if, if when he was talking about, uh, I think, the 35-year-old woman and her friends and telling them about the story or watch this broadcast, it's really great what they're doing. The same thing with us. We want to put the story in your hands, and we want you to share it. We want you to send our story to people you know because they'll trust you to tell them this is interesting. This is important. You have vetted the story for us to them. We're not relying on the fact that we're known as USA Today and we're printed and put out there to be picked up for $2. We're not hoping that you will come to our website because you've already heard from Lewis this morning that the single point of interest website is not the place you really want to be. So we have a website, but we don't expect people to come there. What we want to do is we want to put it in your hands. That's why we're tweeting it out. You link to it, you like it, you share it. You are distributing. You are circulating our news. Okay? That's where we're going. You are the ones. And at the same time, as, as uh, was talked about this morning, a lot of the content is starting to come back. And that's one of the things we're looking at as well. You know, We already have a reader photo of the day that's posted online. Uh, we have reader weather photos that are posted online. But I tell you what, when um, if a tornado hits someplace and a reader will send us a link to it, we, we can use that. We'll credit them. You know, we can't be everywhere. We can't do all these things, but we can post stuff that people send us, and so it's kind of becoming more and more of a two-way operation. It's not as vetted as Lewis was talking about with Forbes, where they have contributors who are paid on a certain model of how many links they get per month or how many views they get per month. We haven't gotten that sophisticated because we don't even have a paywall right now. But we are exploring this whole thing of, again, we used to be the gatekeepers. Now we're more like the facilitators of the conversation. We're putting the information out there. We've gathered it. We're vetting it. But then you're adding to it. You're responding to it. Sometimes your response to it is driving where the story goes. Um, we certainly watch, you know, how's it playing? Uh, what's the traffic like? Uh, how many people are retweeting this? That, uh, that 
you know, is this a big deal or not? Um, there's obvious big stories. There's obviously other things that are just interesting to know. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the middle that depending on your interest could be big news or not. And so a lot of times we are, you know, seeing what's going on out there and making sure, let's make sure that's on the front for the home front. Let's make sure we're tweeting out our version of this. Let's uh, get in a lot of traffic. What's another angle we can do? Uh, how can we make this story unique? Uh, how this video has gone viral. Uh, what, what, talk to people about what does it mean? Why is it becoming so important to you? Getting, again, the audience engaged with us, conversing with us, thinking about us, our brand, USA Today. That's what we want. We want you thinking about us when news happens. You know, be part of us. Be in there. Um, how do we monetize that? I'm not sure we know yet. That's what uh, Hank's trying to work out. That's what uh, Lewis is trying to work out. That's what we're trying to work out. I don't know the ins and outs of all the things, all the strategies we have. But I do know that we're aware that the whole game has shifted. And like I said, we're not, uh, you're becoming our circulation team. We might end up a day when we don't print a newspaper. So why would you come to USA Today if there's no print part of us? I, I think we probably will end up there someday. How soon? I don't know. Things are moving pretty fast. Like I said, change is accelerating. A lot of these technological advances are accelerating. And um, it, uh, it is amazing to me to see how fast the audience is shifting from one new thing to the next. And if um, the trend line keeps up, the print numbers keep getting smaller and smaller. Advertising dollars are smaller and smaller for print. We're at the point now where we're making just as many real dollars through digital advertising as we are through print. And people were saying it would probably be years before, still some years, now it's, we're there. And then it's going to get below. And then what happens? So there's a lot, to, a lot to work out. The, um, the things we're doing to encourage you to like us, we have things we've started with the staff. Again, trying to change that culture. So we have Social Tuesdays. Social Tuesday at USA Today. And what every reporter and editor is supposed to think about is, how do I get my story out on social media fast and in a way that gets a lot of response? So again, we're, we're not going to think about the print or, any, or the website. We're just thinking, how do we get the information out there? And what can we do uh, to do that? Um, one of the things, one of our reporters in Ferguson, when some of the stuff was going on there, you know, she was... Uh, real time walking down the street interviewing people. So this is like what TV might be doing, but it's like she's walking down the street talking to people and then posting it right away. You're right there. She's working on her story, doing the reporting, and she's bringing you into that process. You're seeing in real time the answers she's getting to the questions she's posing. Now that's, uh, that's a lot to put on a reporter. They've got to be balanced. They've got to be careful about what they're doing, just like you've learned in TV. But, you know, this is what's going on out there, is that the reporters are on the front line. They're being asked to do more and more. It's not unlike, though, when I came out of Ole Miss, I worked for the Clarion Ledger in Rankin County, and we had a little bureau, and we put out a paper twice a week. And the first thing they did they said, you're the, one of the new reporters, and you're covering government and schools and things like that. And here's your camera, because you're going to have to take a picture if you have every story that you write. So I had taken a photo class, but I had to sharpen up pretty quick, because you find out pretty quickly. And it was a real eye-opener to me. When you've got a good picture, you get better play in the paper. When you've got a good picture, you get more attention on the web. You get better play on the website. You get shared more. When you got better video, 
sometimes it goes viral, right? So that's where we're at. It's just all this stuff is going on. It's it's pretty incredible time. Um, right now, I think I've I got some statistics from them. About 65 percent of our traffic for USA Today is mobile. That's 50 percent was about four or five years ago. A lot of places are saying, hey, we're 50 percent mobile. We've been at that and we keep growing and it grows every month. We see the numbers going up. So I kind of agree with Hank that we're heading to a time when nothing that any of us have on us in this room will be important as far as how we get information. I think there will be implantables or maybe a eyeglass or something that you're, you've got that will be transmitting a lot of this information to you. I mean, who could have thought just a few years ago? Well, you guys have grown up with the cell phones, right? I didn't. Um, just that change has just been incredible. And so the idea um, that what we're using today, these smartphones, you're going to see a movie in a couple of years, and somebody's going to be talking on a smartphone, and you're going to be laughing out loud because it's so ridiculous. It's like those old portable phones that you see in some old movies from the 80s, you know, and they've got an antenna on them and that sort of thing. Well, you'll be feeling the same way, I think. I don't know this. I just have this feeling based on what I've seen, based on what I, I see happening every week. I don't know anything about these things, but Twitter has something called Periscope that allows you to share your video, right? And then there's something called Meerkat, all right? And which one's better? I don't know. And I bet you next month somebody else comes up with something. And our social media team on one of these Social Tuesdays one day was using both Periscope and Meerkat to film a video they were filming on today's news. Here's what you need to know. One of the things we do every day is five things you need to know today. You know, we want to start the conversation with you. Just like Hank was talking about, turn on the TV and check the weather. We want you to check your USA Today, five things I need to think about today. Okay, maybe the Fed board's meeting on raising interest rates. Maybe the president's in Russia. Maybe the Kentucky's going to get beat in basketball tonight. You know, who knows? But we want you thinking about this. And if you come to us to start your day thinking about us, then when things start happening, you'll be thinking about us again. But um, so we, we film one of these videos. We film these little videos. Here's five things you need to know. Boom, boom, boom. A young reporter stands up and talks about it. Or sometimes an older person. They don't like us older, particularly the older guys. They don't like us on, out there. But the point is they were using these new devices. And they were able to watch in real time how many people were following their filming of the broadcast on Periscope and how many were watching on Meerkat. So there's a lot of data out there that really um, is available. We've got to figure out how to use it. We've got to figure out how to use this to push our brand out there. And, and it's an exciting time to be involved in all of this. And again, I, if you're, anything you're hearing from me is, we don't know where we're going. We're pushing ahead. We're trying different things. We are really trying to get beyond the, uh, the whole idea of, you know, delivery. So, oh, <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> uh, um, we also, um, well, besides that, uh, here's a couple other things for Social Tuesday. Um, the Instagram, you know, another thing people are using. We, uh, we had a few uses of Instagram. We finally said, hey, Photodesk, why don't you use this for everything? Boom. All of a sudden, tremendous response, tremendous traffic. Took us a while to even realize, you know, why don't we have our Photodesk managing what we're putting up through Instagram? It's just, it's just amazing. Um, we do topical things on Facebook, ask questions. 
you know, pose a, an issue, put a, a graphic up and say, what do you think about this? Uh, it's, uh, it's, again, a way of engagement. Um, the um, other thing we do is Mobile Mondays. And Mobile Mondays is a day when we just want people to try anything. So this meerkat that I don't know anything about, one of these Mondays, I'll just pick up my phone and I'll try it. And I'll, maybe I'll do a video of the page one editor editing the lead story for tomorrow and see if anybody cares about that. Uh, we, every night we tweet out the page. Maybe we should take an image of it and you know, do a video of it. I don't know. You know. These are the kinds of things we're thinking about and wrestling with. The, um, we want to get everything out for you to get it and you to move it around for us. That's the, probably the bottom line um, that I want to leave with you. And the, the thing is, um, I've had an exciting career in journalism. There is nothing like being in a newsroom when big news breaks. Okay, There's nothing like getting a story right that everybody else maybe is getting a little wrong. There's nothing like writing a story that helps somebody or changes something that's going on. And I've been involved in all those kinds of things. Um, what's amazing today is all of those things are still happening, but they're happening in totally different ways. They're happening using a technology that you guys know more about than I do. You're more comfortable with it. You grew up with it, right? I can go back and beat most of you on a regular old typewriter, probably, right? Every one of you can beat me probably tweeting something. So you have an advantage coming into the business now because you're fully prepared. You don't need that training. What you need is the basics of journalism that will help you do that job in a proper way so that you are a trusted source, so that you are a brand that you will get shared, your audience will grow, and that's an exciting thing, I think. Um, I've rambled on. I didn't have any, any real great videos or anything for you, which I apologize for, but um, this is what I'm seeing and hearing, and like I said, we're kind of blind. We're working our way through it. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer anything or talk any further about any part of this. Yes. So you mentioned that USA Today is one of the most like circulated newspapers in America, which is a huge achievement. So obviously to get there, you guys had to be innovators in your field. So how did USA Today stay ahead of the curve and ahead of all the other large national papers? Well, um, we got to the top mainly because we were unique. We were a national newspaper. Everybody else, there was the Washington Post, great national reputation, but really circulated in Washington, specialized in governmental coverage. New York Times circulated in certain areas. So, you know, San Francisco Chronicle, you can go on, you can name all these great Dallas Morning News, great newspapers, limited circulation. What we were able to do is take it through the technology, through the satellites and the print sites everywhere, and a uh, good distribution system. We were able to get it everywhere where people expected it. And we made it available when you rented your car and it was slid under your door at the hotel for a time and those kinds of things. And that was all very important to growing us and becoming a brand. Uh, back in the early days, we had uh, you know, um, movie stars and stuff on TV singing a little jingle about, I get my news there every day, USA Today, that sort of thing. So we had to, coming out of nowhere, um, I know the guy who wrote the first cover story for USA Today. He worked with me and he was one of my reporters when I was the White House editor. And he, uh, he spent six months working on mock-ups. And they would call people and say, I'm writing a story for USA Today. Okay, it's a newspaper you've never heard of, and we're not publishing yet, but we need to interview you about this story. And they would do this day after day, and he tells this hilarious story once where he called some guy about a tax issue, the tax collector for the state of Colorado. He sent it to his editors. They didn't like a few things. They sent it back to him. He called them back. I've got a few more questions. The guy says, 
okay, but you're not really writing a story that's going to run any. No, 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 but I've got a few more questions. Okay. Send it to the editors again. Very heavily edited newspaper. We can't put that many editors to work anymore at USA Today, frankly. But at the time, very heavily edited. More questions. He calls the guy back and he says it never dawned on him, but the guy says, uh, all right, let me get this right. This is a newspaper that doesn't exist. You're not publishing anything. Why don't you just make it up? Why? Because he's a journalist, right? He's not going to make anything up. He's going to you know, pursue the answer. But the other thing that I think is really kind of fun is we were heavily criticized in those days. We were McNuggets of news, OK? All we gave anybody was about this much. Believe me, I have. Someone asked me today, do you have your clips from your career? And I have clips from the Clarion Ledger, and they're probably this thick, thick, you know, big books full. And then I have clips from USA Today, and there's probably three envelopes about this thick. Because all the stories are this long, OK? Now, think about that. You, uh, how much are you going to read when a story breaks, right? We were, we were ahead of our time, I think. <coughs> We were writing the short, quick, focused. It was heavily edited because it had to be heavily focused. We only had, in some spaces, six inches. I, would, I was covering Congress, OK? They vote down aid to the Contras, which was a big issue back then. And I've got to put the vote in. I've got to say what Tip O'Neill said. I've got to say what Reagan said. And I've got to say what happens next. And I've got five paragraphs to do that. So it's a great, you know, I think we almost got away from that at USA Today, but it's what we have to do more and more now to be competitive. You've got to get that story out. It's got to be focused. You've got to hook the reader. You've got to tell them what happened quickly. And then they can read further if they want to. But most of them are using mobile, 65%. They're not going to sit there. How many of you read, how many times do you, when you're looking at something, do you page over? Two, three, that many, one? Do you just look at what's there and then go on to something else, right? So McNuggets of news. I'm saying we're ahead of our time. We just didn't know that that's what was going to fit. You were ahead. <laughs> and staying ahead is the hard thing, you know? And the Washington Post made fun of you. Oh, yeah. For the way you did it, and yet now they've been sold just to get rid of them. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And we'll see what happens, you know, with that. Maybe they'll be delivered by drone. I mean, right? Bezos wants to deliver things by drone. Maybe the paper comes every morning by drone. Maybe that'll be cool and people will subscribe just so they can get a drone dropping the paper off in the morning. Who knows? Yes. You know what, basically journalism skills. Um, social media team is like the breaking news team. It's like the Washington team. They are more focused on promoting the brand out there. So they're more like part of the delivery system. But they're writing stories too. They're scrolling and seeing stuff on social media, grabbing it, making a call or two, or doing something to make it more USA Today feel and then pushing it back out again. So you got to be a journalist. You got to know what a story is. You got to know what's um, entertaining people and uh, what's hooking them. And then you've got to figure out how do we make that our story and push it back out. And then, you know, through the social media stuff, we're getting more people to like the story and add, add to it. Do you have a question? Somebody? Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry.
Yeah, no. No, that's good. And, and so what we've always done, and we do it a lot on the web because there's just so many opportunities, but we did it in newspapers too. Sidebars, breakouts, graphics. I mean, USA Today was the first graphic newspaper. Um, when we talk about storytelling, some stories can be told just with a graphic. Um, some stories that are more complicated. Okay, you get the news, but then here, you know, what's behind the Fed decision to raise interest rates? What are the markets likely to do? These are all separate. We talked about different angles to get you into the story. So you might think about it from a market perspective. Oh my gosh, what this is going to do to the market? So we've got a story that starts with that point, but we try to get all the information in there. And then we have just informational stories. You know, they don't disappear. They're on the web. So if you go search, you'll see a list of our current stories, and then you'll see the other stuff we ran. If you go to our investigatives thing, you'll have the stuff we ran yesterday, and you'll see the stuff Brad Heath has done six months ago, and a year ago, and three years ago. So if you liked what he did on that, and you missed the other stuff, you can read it. Um, tax season, right? Everybody's got something going on. We, we're putting stuff up. We might put a story on Facebook. We might have a tip of the day that goes out on mobile. You know, when do you really, when do you, how do you file for an extension? You know, what if you've overpaid your taxes? What if you've underpaid your taxes? What if you this, that, the other thing? You know, so we, we'll put a tip of the day out, but you can also go to the web and find all these tips in one story. So we, you know, we're trying to hook you back in and then maybe you have a question about taxes and they're telling me about how to file for an extension. Maybe they know more about this issue I've got or something I don't understand. And then you can go back in, you link to that and then you see all the other content we've got. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that's the way we do it. Does that answer the question, you think? Anyone else? Okay, well, I thank you very much for your time and uh...